Okay, afternoon everyone. So one of the really uh, interesting aspects of uh, infectious diseases is that you're dealing um, with two organisms, the, the host and the pathogen, and uh, with completely different biology, obviously. And when these two have had an opportunity to meet for a while and co-evolved, uh, there's usually less than a, a catastrophic event. But in situations where a pathogen is able to infect a host and they meet for the first time, there usually is a, a reasonably catastrophic <coughs> event. And that's the area of uh, new and emerging infectious diseases. And we've sort of seen that with, with several different infections and probably the, the worst amongst them would be the, the viral hemorrhagic fevers like Ebola, but much closer to home and still quite bad was the, uh, the Nipah virus and, and Hendra in Australia. So it's a, a great pleasure to have Peter Daniels come up from the CSIRO Animal Health Labs down in Geelong. Um, so Peter is the assistant director down there and he's also the leader of the um, Diagnostic Surveillance and Response Unit down at AL. And he was pretty much instrumental in the investigation of uh, Nipah virus outbreak in Malaysia when it happened. So it's a real pleasure to have him up here and uh, introduce AL to us and also tell us a little bit about what happens down there. Thanks, Mark, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's, uh, I say it's nice to be back here. It's sort of a rather long bow, I think. But uh, in my younger years, I uh, had the opportunity to come to a, uh, I think it was an IUCC uh, two-week training course in uh, research methods for cancer. And I was just starting my PhD at the time on squamous cell carcinoma of the skin of sheep. And uh, it was a really exciting experience to, to come down here at... Uh, Really got me hooked, I think, on uh, laboratory work and, and research, and of course I ended up getting my PhD and uh, drifting off and doing other things, as many of us do. But uh, I'd like the opportunity to uh, show you a bit of about what we uh, do in Geelong these days. And uh, uh, talking with Mark, I, I ascertained that uh, you know you haven't had uh, uh, presentations about the Australian Animal Health Health Lab here in, in recent times, so. Uh, we'll start with a, a, uh, a few, uh, an introduction to the place. And uh, after talking about the facility, we'll talk a bit about the science, uh, uh, science that uh, I've been involved in, but uh, science that's uh, going on there, <coughs> and finish with some closing thoughts. Now, the Australian Animal Health Laboratory is uh, built as a high containment facility for Australia, and uh, uh, but it's managed by CSIRO and uh, as we know the nation's uh, uh, research organisation per se uh, is active across a whole range of uh, fields of human endeavour uh, but the, uh, the little bit that uh, we're responsible for in Geelong is uh, what's called the biosecurity domain. Uh, ARL is uh, uh, considered by the government as a, as a national facility, a CSIRO uh, runs, uh, manages three of these on behalf of the government. We can see them listed there. And uh, uh, I do encourage people to think of this laboratory in Geelong as a national facility. And uh, we'll zoom in on that particular aspect uh, as we go more into the talk. But it is an advanced high containment laboratory. Uh, other countries are rapidly building uh, equivalent facilities. Uh, uh, you know, Germany has a very nice facility at the Isle of Reims. Uh, uh, there's facilities uh, already built in the US uh, to, to uh, PC3 level and uh, their transboundary animal disease, their foreign animal disease unit in, uh, in Plum Island is uh, either going to be refurbished or, or relocated. So uh, while we have this facility in Australia at the present time, it's, uh, uh, it's not going to have that unique niche that we've enjoyed the last 10 years or so. Now, in terms of the uh, facility, that uh, construction, as we can see, uh, began in uh, 1978, uh, officially opened in 85. Uh, we were all, you know, I wasn't there, but the, uh, the scientific staff were in there using the facility in 84. We ran it for a year uh, uh, without being in containment mode, and then in 85 it, uh, uh, it went into a secure mode, as we call it cost a lot of money in those days and it's worth even uh, a lot more money uh, these days and uh, but the uh, 
defining feature of it uh, uh, was built to a massive PC3 facility, what the Americans call PC3 AG, which is uh, you know, more than uh, the standard PC3 facility, and it was built to contain uh, diseases of animals that don't occur in this country. But uh, one of the defining uh, features of the design that's really come into prominence has been the inclusion of PC4 facilities, which we'll look at as we go through. We've got uh, about 300 staff, uh, let's say about 180 uh, uh, of those would be in the two science areas that I mentioned and uh, quite a lot of students, I couldn't put an exact figure on, I apologise, but uh, in the order of 25 uh, uh, PhDs and honours students and, and those sort of things. So there's opportunities there for, the, uh, uh, for people to get involved. The, uh, but uh, the primary responsibility of uh, people like myself is to maintain the biocontainment. Uh, we'll just flick through these pictures. You can see that it's located ne next to the water, next to salt flax, next to a golf course, so a bit of suburbia in front of it, and uh, deliberately located so it's away from uh, farmed uh, livestock. And uh, that uh, is in recognition of the concern that the rural lobby has that uh, uh, dreadful things are going to escape from this facility, but uh, in fact they they don't uh, touch wood, as they say. So there's an aerial view, and you can see the the main building about the uh, the size of a football field or more, and uh, uh, most all of this area here, all of this area is uh, within a uh, high high containment PC3 level, as, as well as some of the support services here. We've got uh, engineering workshops, a uh, machine room, and uh, an admin block, and a, uh, and a water tower. So uh, if we look at the floor pan, we can see that it's sort of like a little uh, city within a city. Each of these uh, laboratory suites uh, is self-contained, so it's a PC3 facility in itself, as, as are the animal rooms. Uh, we've got a couple of uh, animal rooms that uh, operate at PC4, so I'll just draw your attention to this one here. That room there is big enough to... Uh, uh, we did a hendrovirus experiment with seven horses in it, so that gives you an idea of the uh, capacity of, of, of that PC4 facility, and that is unique in the world and, and likely to remain soon. So, uh, Staff come in each day through airlocks, and the airlocks have got showers in them, and. Uh, and it's part of the daily ritual to shower out at the end of the day. The design is, uh, is one where all of the activities, uh, both laboratories and animal suites, are conducted on the third floor. Uh, these levels have nothing to do with PC levels, but uh, on the third floor we have our work areas. Uh, two levels below that uh, are engaged in uh, collection of liquid effluent and disposal of waste. And the level above is uh, for the HEPA filtering of the air. All the air that comes in is HEPA filtered. All the uh, air that uh, is, goes out is, uh, passes through two HEPA filters. It was designed to uh, uh, try to avoid problems of claustrophobia, if you like. So you can see all the corridors are nice wide and there's uh, artwork, which I think was probably... Uh, you know, quite nice uh, at the time, back in 1980, <laughs> but uh, we got a bit used to it, to tell the truth. <laughs> the, and I say, a little city within a city, although it's uh, all within the, uh, the PC3 facility, uh, including the canteen here, because the laboratory areas are managed uh, separately behind their own airlocks, uh, we can have a, a canteen where staff can go, lunch, morning teas or whatever, and have a glimpse of the outside world. Some of the facilities, the, uh, these are the HEPA filters. This is the type of uh, door we have on the airlocks. Uh, I've just walked uh, quickly through your new PC3 facility uh, and uh, sort of noted some differences. Uh, here we have an inflatable rubber seal around. So and when I say we're PC3 AG, these are the types of features that we're obliged to have that uh, aren't in a standard PC3 facility. So people to walk from uh, work area to work area, uh, lab suite to lab suite, will go into an airlock, it'll seal behind them, uh, the air will be exchanged and then after a 20 second period or whatever it is, then uh, it's only then that the, uh, the door to move forward uh, is, is released by the computer system. Whole buildings run by computers of course, the, we've just put in, uh, had a 25 year refit, 
and uh, put in a new uh, computer system. I think there's about 6,000 different alarm points in the building that are monitored. So uh, obviously we have a couple of people in a, in a control centre that's got, uh, got people there uh, 24 hours of the day, every day of the year, and uh, just monitoring the site, monitoring these uh, alarm systems. The, uh, I mentioned that downstairs is for effluent treatment. Here we've got uh, sort of the, the big autoclaves. Uh, there's a continuous flow effluent treatment or there's uh, systems to pressure, giant pressure cookers, if you like, to treat the effluent at uh, batch. This is the, what the animal rooms look like inside, and you can see this is uh, one of those big rooms where uh, quite a number of uh, large animals, horses or cattle, can be held at the one time. So to get more into how the place is run, we uh, uh, about seven years ago uh, uh, split our science into uh, the Diagnosis, Surveillance and Response Group, for which I'm uh, responsible, uh, delivering on those national facility uh, obligations uh, with respect to foreign animal disease diagnosis, emergency infectious disease diagnosis, and uh, uh, let the people in research uh, uh, sort of just focus on uh, on their research projects uh, rather than trying to have people move from one to the other and never quite getting the prioritisation of which one is important today uh, to everyone's satisfaction. So current arrangement uh, works very efficiently, but of course uh, uh, some of the folk here rather wish they were in research some of the time and. Uh, and uh, dare I say it, some of the people here probably think they're a little bit better than the, the folk in diagnostics because they're in research, you know. But uh, these people here, you know, they don't do their work under a quality assurance system, point out to everyone, they wouldn't even know if their incubator was the right temperature or not, so how can they be all that crash hot? <laughs> so, <laughs> so those are the sorts of sociological dynamics, I suppose. In terms of... Uh, the responsibilities, I think we've spoken pretty well enough about it. We, we do have this overarching responsibility for the, not only the initial diagnosis of a, a major disease event, but you just imagine if there was a foot and mouth disease outbreak, uh, all of the specimens that would be generated around the country. So we've got high throughput systems uh, uh, as well as rapid diagnosis systems. Uh, this is a term uh, that uh, the veterinary world uses for diseases like foot and mouth disease, uh, uh, the, the major plagues of animals that interrupt uh, uh, trade in animals and animal products. Uh, some of the zoonotic diseases like avian influenza are also in that category, uh, you know, quite rightly so. But uh, as well as these, we maintain a diagnostic capability for 55 different uh, diseases of animals and poultry and 40 different diseases of uh, aquatic uh, organisms, but uh, at the same time are obliged to you know, be able to take on anything, so, such as, for instance, the Hendra virus outbreak. Uh, and uh, you'll be surprised at the number of unknowns and, uh, and new situations that arise uh, sort, of, uh, uh, sort of each year, basically. We, we won't go into them because it's a, it's a big topic in its own certain right, but uh, fortunately most of them aren't of dire consequence. But there's always uh, something new. Uh, being in this position here with this level of expertise, we uh, supply biosecurity advice to the state and federal governments and to the uh, industry bodies, uh, support, support of research uh, and training programs, and once again, uh, never forgetting we're responsible for maintaining that, uh, the biocontainment of that facility. So the talk today will focus um, pretty well on uh, zoonosis, zoonotic diseases, and you can see in the blue list there that, uh, uh, that uh, we've been involved in really some quite interesting uh, investigations over the years. Uh, when we're working at, uh, with uh, a disease like avian influenza, and uh, this is in the uh, animal facility, a couple of colleagues from uh, Vietnam geared up to work on H5N1 with us. Uh, but when we move on to uh, organisms with which we work at PC4, then we're into the fully encapsulated suits, as, as we call them. And here's a, a range of people doing a range of uh, things uh, in the PC4 laboratory. Uh, and I'm happy to say the, the old PC4 laboratory. So here's an interesting thing for you all. This is uh, a picture of your PC4 laboratory. 
It's brand new, it's just commissioned last week. Uh, uh, the, uh, it's built uh, with uh, NCRIS funds, if that means anything to you, but federal government money for the National Collaborative Research Infrastructure Scheme, if I've got it correct. And so we've now, uh, so as well as that 70 square metres of old PC4 space, we've got another 300 square metres of laboratory space at PC4. And the idea is that uh, uh, the nation really can't afford uh, to uh, have too many PC4 labs around. Uh, that the, uh, the, you know, the budget for ARL each year is 45 million uh, going up the whole time. They're really expensive things to run. So under this NCRIS uh, funding, the idea is that there's enough uh, laboratory space to, uh, to have uh, people who aren't CSIRO researchers, who uh, could, be, could be from Walter and Eliza Hall, could be from Vidral, could be from one of the state departments. Uh, if, uh, if there's research that, uh, that they want to do that they can fund and they can meet all of the health and safety requirements and microbiological security requirements, then uh, you know, it really is practical. The thing is designed, the systems are set up to welcome uh, researchers from other institutions to use this uh, national facility. Now, the sorts of things that uh, have been done over the years, uh, I think everyone's familiar with Hendra, and uh, it's pretty safe to say in retrospect that dealing with this Hendra virus outbreak in Brisbane in 1994, uh, put uh, ARL uh, on the map in terms of establishing credentials for working with infectious disease. And uh, I wasn't there at the time, let me add, but uh, uh, we can see that, uh, that uh, it's uh, affected the way we do business, uh, got us interested in, uh, in fruit bats and showing uh, the uh, infections uh, for which fruit bats, uh, terobid species, uh, can be the reservoir host and we've gone on from there. So uh, by the time the Nipah virus outbreak had, uh, was uh, in uh, full swing, shall we say, in, in Malaysia, then I had joined the staff, had been involved in, uh, in uh, work with uh, Hendra virus in, in those large animal facilities, uh, uh, experimental infections in horses and so forth. And uh, so uh, I became, uh, you know, I was nominated by the laboratory to uh, be one of the people joining the international team to, to deal with Hendra viruses. And, uh, you know, you can see the resemblance. That's actually myself there, uh, working uh, with, uh, with Hume Field from the Queensland Department of Primary Industry and with the Malaysian uh, chief pathologist uh, getting geared up in the background. We didn't have enough of these facilities, so we designed systems and... Uh, Keep coming back to that over and over in the talk. Uh, you just don't charge in and do sort of what might seem best immediately. You sit back and have a think about it first. And in modern parlance, uh, you say you do a risk uh, analysis. And so uh, our uh, risk analysis at the time said that the whoever was actually working on an infected animal should have the full protection. And the people who were in supporting roles, uh, because we didn't have enough gear, they uh, would sort of wear these other arrangements. Anyway, you can see the stats on the board there that, uh, that, that at the time uh, there were 282 human cases in Malaysia and 105 of those folk uh, uh, died. Uh, there were cases in, in countries around the region and of the people who survived, some had sequelae and, and some of those folk with sequelae have, uh, have uh, uh, also passed away. And, uh, and we were aware of that, that possibility because of... Uh, what happened in the Hendra virus back in 94 and 95, where a, a person who'd assisted with an necropsy of a horse uh, had an influenza-like illness uh, at the time and uh, then developed an encephalitis and, and died a year later. So uh, having survived an infection with Nipah or Hendra virus isn't a really a comfortable position to be in. The, uh, the, so we had... Uh, uh, close on a thousand farms destroyed, close on a million pigs uh, destroyed. And when I say destroyed, uh, uh, there was uh, you know, zero tolerance uh, for this infection and uh, because not a lot was known about it, zero tolerance for the possibility that it might remain in the environment. So these pig farms, they were destroyed so they uh, would never raise uh, pigs there again. So, uh, to reflect on a bit of science, if you like, if you call epidemiology a science, then, uh, and, I, and I sincerely hope you do, the, uh, 
uh, part of epidemiological science is to uh, train uh, the devotees in uh, conducting outbreak investigations in a structured way. And uh, you can see right up the top, the uh, you've got to establish your operational systems here. Right? If you can uh, provide good physical infrastructure, that's a bonus, but you must have uh, uh, operational systems about how the job is going to be done and, and to which everyone adheres. And the Malaysians were very good at that. They uh, that they had, uh, you know, a ministerial committee and an, an operational committee, and uh, people like myself who was there as visitors. We knew that eight o'clock uh, every Friday morning we had to be in the Ministry of Health in Kuala Lumpur, uh, ready for a debriefing and, and whatever it was. And at that point, we'd uh, work out what our work plan was going to be for the following week. So uh, really uh, highly coordinated. But going through your outbreak investigation, you've got to confirm the diagnosis, uh, ideally establish a case definition so you can go out into unaffected areas and, and, and try and identify new foci of infection. Uh, the descriptive epidemiologists will describe the outbreak. Uh, the uh, epi people will conduct analytical studies and to, to uh, try to identify risk factors for infection. And that all leads to an hypothesis of what's actually going on here. And, uh, and from that point, you can make rational measures to uh, contain the outbreak. So going through some of those steps, the, uh, the tissues we took uh, at that necropsy uh, on the pig farm we looked at before, we were able to rapidly get those to Geelong by uh, overnight courier, and there the immunohistochemistry confirmed the presence of a Hendra-like uh, uh, infection in the, in the tissues, in this case in the respiratory epithelium of the, uh, of the bronchioles. Uh, the investigation showed that species other than pigs and people would be infected and uh, that uh, some serological studies of collections of bats done uh, you know, early in the outbreak were showing that teropid bats were sero seropositive. So, uh, so where does that leave us? This is the uh, distribution. You've probably seen maps like this before, but it's the distribution of the teropid genus uh, globally. And so that tells us that uh, what happened uh, in Malaysia can happen in other places. And we know that it's happening in Bangladesh. This happens to be a, a kapok tree with uh, a colony of bats in it uh, in a rural area in Indonesia. So uh, uh, the need for continuing surveillance is, is, is ever-present, shall we say. These folk here are... Uh, uh, taking blood samples because we were able to design a, uh, a national surveillance scheme and, and it was that scheme that saved the Malaysian pig industry because we were able to uh, 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 sample all of the remaining pig farms in Malaysia twice in a three month period uh, with a, you know, an epidemiologically designed program uh, that gave confidence that if a farm got through two rounds of testing we could consider the farm uh, not having active Nipah virus uh, infection on it at, at that time. And uh, on the basis of that and continuing rounds of surveillance, uh, uh, Malaysia was uh, in a year or so recognised by the World Animal Health Organisation as having cleared the Nipah virus infection from its pigs. But uh, to, uh, to think about the, the whole process, j just let me indulge a little hobby horse of mine before, before we go on to the uh, the next slide, and uh, you know, I love it when people say this particular bug has a uh, has a strategy for emergence, and uh, and sort of it's it's a useful way. You know, I don't say we shouldn't do that, but so long as we've got in our own mind that uh, these bugs aren't thinking about how to to emerge, it's sort of I like to think of you know. But, uh, uh, bacteria or viruses like a bag of marbles. You know, if I were to bring a bag of marbles and drop it on the floor here, they'd just go everywhere. They'd go wherever they could until something stopped them. And so it's understanding those boundaries that uh, will uh, prevent the transmission of infection that's very important in the control of infectious diseases. So uh, uh, one is obviously the pathogenesis and our research in Geelong and uh, just been talking with people here, you know, your research here is, uh, a lot of it is focused on to understanding the pathogenesis because that uh, establishes the boundaries of what's possible biologically and what's not. But uh, in animal diseases and I think with human diseases, uh, uh, there, uh, 
the things that allow transmission uh, sort of don't stop with the biology of the organism itself. We've got uh, sort of more uh, broad influences such as climate change and the global village and international travel spreading things around and uh, those are all uh, sort of factors to consider and the human behaviour and uh, for instance the uh, the Nipah virus outbreak in Malaysia would never have infected so many people if pigs hadn't been moved from farm to farm and so that was part of the culture at the time if you had a sick animal then you sold it. If you had a whole farm full of sick animals, then you sell the whole damn farm and get rid of them. And uh, and uh, I think with our modern, uh, you know, uh, considerations, understanding of uh, farm gate biosecurity and whatever, I think we've gone beyond those days. But it's important to learn from that lesson. And uh, and so that's uh, basically what we're saying in, in this slide: that human behaviours are ever so important. So if we look at uh, one of these steps in our uh, outbreak investigation process, the development of a hypothesis, then we can see that uh, very quickly the, the teams and, and Hume Field in particular were able to put together the evidence that, that this uh, Nipah virus, just as Hendra virus is in Australia, is present in a wildlife host and we can hypothesise that we must have had a jump from the wildlife host to the pigs uh, to uh, allow them to function uh, as an amplifying host. But the, obviously then that jump is not enough to explain the outbreak of human disease. We have these other factors uh, that become involved and uh, the intensive pig farming uh, industry which created a huge naive population for the Nipah virus to amplify in. Uh, and as we've just said, the moving of these pigs from farm to farm, not only locally where, where it was uh, uh, initiated, but uh, also quite long distances to to farms uh, south of uh, KL, uh, where uh, sort of most of the human cases occurred. And uh, remember the data we put up in the beginning, we had 11 cases in Singapore where uh, pigs, apparently healthy pigs, went to the abattoir, were processed, and uh, abattoir workers got infected. So uh, moving animals around and uh, is the way diseases get spread. So uh, we'll come to it later when we talk about bird flu. Uh, if you can stop the movement of animals, if you can have a, a, a standstill uh, where no animals move, then uh, that goes a long way to controlling the onward transmission. Not always possible, of course. So uh, with the uh, Nipah virus uh, episode uh, over, then... Uh, Things didn't really settle down. Uh, you can see on this table that uh, Hendra virus cases have uh, continued to occur in horses in Queensland and uh, also in northern New South Wales. And we can see here the, uh, the figure that uh, we now have had uh, seven people infected with Hendra virus and uh, unfortunately four of those folk have uh, died. And uh, I'm not being unnecessarily cruel when I sort of bring up the human behaviour again because Perhaps uh, uh, in the beginning, when the disease wasn't known, then uh, you know people would uh, worked with it in in the normal way without uh, too much uh, personal protection. Uh, but later on, uh, then uh, some of the uh, exposures, if you like, were the result clearly the result of people making a decision to not worry about the advice about using personal protection because it's too hot, it's too much bother because. You go onto a farm uh, and try to treat a guy's horse and you've got your overalls and your gloves on and your mask, you look pretty, very stupid and, uh, and he was there with the horse anyway. But people have uh, got the message now, so uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the Queensland or whatever their agency is for workplace health and safety, uh, they're right on to the vets and, uh, and uh, if a veterinarian uh, becomes infected uh, with Hendra virus these days, the first thing that's likely to happen is that the workplace health and safety people will come along and whack a charge onto that poor individual because uh, uh, wearing the proper protective equipment is one behaviour that uh, is really insisted on. But, uh, <clears throat> so uh, in that vein, just let me show you some uh, uh, pictures of... Uh, uh, the sort of work we still do from, from Arl, uh, based on uh, earlier experience. Uh, uh, it's uh, 
because not enough is known of the uh, biology, the pathogenesis of, of Hendra virus infection in horses, uh, then uh, the, uh, it, it's the, uh, not the custom, and it's the regulations so that any seropositive animal will be uh, destroyed. And so uh, there were a couple of animals, uh, I think we, in 2010 we, we had to put down three animals and uh, because Arles got the expertise to work with these things, then teams from Arles uh, went and, uh, and did the job. So here's a job we did in, uh, in Proserpine in, uh, with no facilities, just out on, uh, in the bush, as you can see. But once again, before we even left the laboratory, we sat down and we worked out exactly how we were going to do this job. You plan your experiments and you plan uh, your interventions in the same way. So uh, we're going to have a, a pit in the ground to dispose of the animal. He's going to be on a plastic uh, sheet to uh, stop contamination of the ground as much as possible with body fluids. We're going to have a limited number of, uh, of uh, pathologists doing the necropsy. We're going to have the uh, necropsy area separated from the, uh, the area where specimens are processed. And that area itself also potentially in an infected area that's going to be clearly demarcated from uh, the surrounding country and although it's only demarcated with red and white tape uh, you can operate there at PC4 conditions uh, as successfully and as safely as in a laboratory providing the training and, and the forethought is, uh, is adequate. So we can see the, uh, what I've just described, the, uh, the horse on the plastic, the, uh, the pathologists uh, doing their job, uh, the team uh, processing specimens and then uh, cleaning up when it's all over. So uh, in uh, 2011, uh, a big year for animal diseases, and uh, so one of the things that happened is we had the most number of Hendra virus outbreaks in horses uh, that uh, we'd ever seen in a single year. And you see the figures down the bottom, uh, 15 cases. Uh, uh, in the whole of the history of the disease to that point in time, there'd only been 44 cases. So. Uh, an incredibly big year. I think the debate is still on as to why, but uh, remember that we've gone through a f uh, quite a long period of drought followed by periods of good rains. We could hypothesise that the uh, teropid bat population uh, had probably multiplied, that there would be a lot of naive uh, members uh, in that teropid bat population and that there might therefore be uh, a lot of contamination of the environment at the particular times of the year when this occurred. So, uh, but uh, you know, I think those are issues that are still being worked through. Uh, importantly, uh, part of the story is that there weren't any human exposures uh, uh, in 2011. So people are rapidly adapting their behaviour to uh, accommodate the risks. And uh, again, in 2012, uh, no, some cases this year already but uh, no human exposures or significant exposures. But anyway, these things, uh, of course, uh, drive the research program uh, uh, at Arles, uh, with which I'm not personally involved, but uh, uh, my colleague, Dr. Deborah Middleton, uh, leads this pathogenesis work. The uh, models are uh, in, uh, in ferrets, and it's a mouse model just published last week, I think, uh, our work on that. And of course, there's the work in horses. And uh, there's just a shot of this PC4 uh, animal room uh, uh, with uh, horses under Hendra virus experimentation. Let's look at the sort of data that uh, can uh, come out of, of this type of work. Uh, here we've got one horse uh, experimentally infected uh, at day zero with uh, Hendra virus by the oronasal route. We see that uh, the the real-time PCR detection uh, is in red here, and we can see that uh, in uh, the nasal swabs, uh, we're getting a PCR product uh, uh, quite early, not, not in the two days after the oronasal challenge, but after there's been a period for uh, infection to establish and a replication of the virus to occur in the nasal cavity, then we're getting a high level of uh, virus there. And uh, this is the important bit. You see that that uh, excretion or detection of virus in the nasal cavity of this animal is occurring before temperature rise and before clinical signs. So that really uh, creates a conundrum for the veterinary profession, uh, profession for workplace health and safety concerns. 
because that was saying that virtually any clinically normal horse at the right time of the year could in fact uh, have an active Hendra virus uh, uh, in its nasal passages that won't become evident until a couple of days later. So how on earth can you work with horses under those circumstances? That uh, description of that uh, bit of pathogenesis really drove the, uh, the uh, need and uh, rammed home the need for the advisability of having a vaccine for uh, working horses. So here's a couple of uh, uh, comparable uh, challenge experiments. Uh, horses one and two have been uh, vaccinated uh, uh, a few weeks prior to a challenge and a control animal here uh, is showing uh, basically the same pattern of excretion uh, of a virus in the nasal passages prior to onset of temperature and, uh, and clinical signs. But uh, just a short time, albeit uh, admittedly a short time after uh, uh, the vaccination, uh, these two animals have negligible excretion of the Hendra virus. So that uh, uh, has given a lot of uh, impetus to developing a vaccine so that horses can be used. And uh, once that's on the market and, uh, and, and these early promising results are uh, uh, validated, you can imagine that a veterinarian is going to be very loath to treat a horse that uh, can't be shown to have been uh, vaccinated against Hendra virus. And uh, although uh, the rules of engagement, if you like, haven't been drawn up, we can uh, predict that that uh, is the way things might go. So as we said, uh, the Hendra virus story, the Nipah virus story, they're uh, sort of directed uh, the focus of uh, some of our work at Al onto uh, uh, the tropid bat and uh, how it uh, functions as a reservoir host. So I haven't put the data on the board, but uh, in this experiment and experiments like this, uh, tropid bats were challenged with either Nipah or Hendra virus. And although you could demonstrate infection had occurred, you couldn't really get back a lot of virus. Uh, there's not much evidence of transmission from any of the normal uh, routes of excretion, just sporadic uh, uh, bits of virus coming through. And so to understand that the pathogenesis of viral infections in bats uh, became uh, you know, one of our prior priority areas of research and uh, Dr. Lin Fu Wang is uh, uh, leading that and, uh, you know, uh, I really suggest uh, that's the topic for a full seminar. But anyway, that interest in bats is uh, sort of has flown through into other areas and uh, and I'll found itself in the position of being able to make a contribution to our understanding of SARS uh, when it came out and you can see here the title of the paper with several workers from Geelong here together with Chinese colleagues uh, with uh, Lin Fu Wang uh, uh, the, uh, orchestrating, the guiding the research. And of course uh, the Geelong team were the only team on, on following this line up and, and so that uh, work that SARS has got a reservoir host in, in bats in China uh, verified by other workers in Hong Kong. So let's leave uh, Hendra and Nipah viruses there and, uh, and uh, look briefly at some other zoonotic infections. The uh, uh, pandemic H1N1 wasn't uh, a, uh, you know, a major uh, event in the veterinary world in this country. Australia is one of uh, the very few, perhaps only Australia and New Zealand are the only countries in the world that claim freedom of swine influenza from their pig populations. So. Uh, our pig populations uh, were free of influenza virus infection and against that background when uh, uh, the public uh, and uh, particularly the age groups of people who uh, normally are looking after uh, uh, pigs and uh, working on pig farms who were getting pandemic H1N1 2009 infections then we uh, had uh, reports of uh, uh, influenza-like disease in pigs, so only a mild disease but nonetheless, the, uh, the farmers reported it, and uh, so we have isolates from uh, the outbreak in Queensland and Victoria. We couldn't get an isolate out of any of the uh, specimens from New South Wales. So a couple of things in the molecular analysis. Uh, the, although you can't uh, read the data, the, uh, uh, these viruses from the pig farm in Victoria were sort of grouping with uh, human isolates, working in collaboration with the 
spoke at the WHO Influenza Collaborating Centre at Vidral. Uh, they're a grouping with uh, isolates from Victoria, as is the case from Queensland. And importantly for us, from a veterinary point of view, uh, uh, these were uh, sufficiently different for us to uh, be satisfied that we weren't dealing with a case of transmission, you know, of movement of animals from one farm to another, which would have been contrary to biosecurity principles. Uh, we were dealing with separate uh, incidences of infection. And from the uh, Queensland uh, uh, situation, then analysis was possible because one of the workers on the farm uh, uh, had influenza at that time and uh, an isolate was available from this person and we can see here that's uh, compared with the isolate from that particular pig farm and there's a 100% homology across all of the sequences uh, uh, compared at that time and these are other uh, pandemic H1N1 isolates uh, from uh, America and uh, I think New Zealand and uh, so we can see that uh, we're probably dealing with a situation, we've probably identified a situation where the human-animal interfaces, uh, as people in WHO call it, where uh, we wouldn't know if the infection passed from the pigs to the person or the person to the pigs, uh, because the temporal relationships aren't all that clear, but uh, they're animals and uh, people infected with the same virus at the same time. So that was uh, an interesting finding. We said uh, 2011 was a big year uh, for animal diseases in this country and uh, you know, following on from that story about having had years of drought and then a couple of good years and, uh, and the, uh, the natural fauna of our country uh, sort of catching up, uh, then for some reason or other we had a, a massive outbreak of flaviviral encephalitis in horses and this is just so unusual. Uh, here on this uh, epidemic curve, uh, the, the figures are, were eventually uh, about 750 uh, cases of flaviviral encephalitis identified right across Australia, but mostly in uh, Victoria and New South Wales. And that's against a background where uh, Cunjin virus infections in horses uh, causing clinical signs are pretty well undescribed. Uh, there's, uh, there's only one or two cases in our published literature where uh, Cunjin virus infection has been associated with disease in a horse, and uh, similarly for Murray Valley encephalitis. Now, most of these cases were uh, Cunjin, although some were Murray Valley encephalitis, but, but nonetheless, to have this level of disease in, in horses was uh, really uh, quite unusual. And fortunately, uh, the uh, another unusual aspect was that uh, uh, that uh, we didn't have much flavivirus disease in the human population at that, at that time. We did have more than usual and for instance I don't think we'd uh, seen cases of MVE in, uh, in the southern states uh, uh, since the mid 70s. It's, it's on the next slide I think and, uh, and uh, we don't usually see cases of Kunz in, in people either. And this is uh, interesting because uh, Kunjin, uh, if you're familiar with the molecular uh, analyses, Kunjin uh, is a, uh, a strain, if you wish, of West Nile virus and it maps right in the middle of West Nile viruses globally. And uh, we in the veterinary profession prefer to keep calling it Kunjin because West Nile virus infection of horses does cause encephalitis all around the world. It's, uh, but until 2011, we, uh, it was an unknown, it wasn't a disease agent in this country. So to help uh, sort of focus uh, the human mind on that aspect that West Nile's a disease agent and Kunjin uh, traditionally is not a disease agent, uh, then uh, we kept the separate names. But uh, so to have uh, a massive outbreak was really quite unusual. So as we said, the uh, uh, Murray Valley encephalitis activity hadn't been seen in this part of the world since 1974 and uh, you know I think uh, people are still analysing that. Uh, certainly the veterinary world is still uh, trying to analyse why uh, this particular strain of Kunjin would suddenly be uh, uh, pathogenic when others uh, haven't been and, uh, and what's the drivers of that and why the disparity if we've suddenly got a virulent uh, Kunjin virus, uh, why is it only showing disease in horses at this point, whereas we know in North America, uh, West Nile virus has uh, uh, 
causing fatalities in all sorts of animals, uh, people and humans included. Uh, moving on again, the, one of the things that uh, we do at the Australian Animal Health Laboratory is work with colleagues in Southeast Asia. And uh, there uh, we're trying to help them professionally, uh, uh, help with issues of food security in the region, but also uh, because uh, uh, Australians like to see their dollar well spent in their own interests, we have to point out that uh, our being involved in uh, work in Southeast Asia is actually helpful to this country, both in uh, being able to know what's going on and also being able to help those uh, countries uh, actually control their infectious diseases. So uh, you can see the map on the top right hand corner, uh, the countries in which we've uh, got uh, uh, projects running in Southeast Asia at the present time. An interesting development there has been uh, a move uh, beyond bilateral support to countries like Indonesia or Vietnam, which we did uh, at the start of the bird flu outbreaks, and now with uh, the help of FAO working in networks of support across all of the ASEAN countries. So now when, when we uh, uh, are transferring, say, bird flu technology, uh, it won't only go to one or two countries, uh, it's going to, to places like Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos and whatever, and, uh, and all of those uh, countries and the people in their national veterinary labs in those countries are coming together quite regularly for, uh, uh, for meetings and uh, just developing uh, capacity and uh, that's an area we've been very much involved in and so we're recognised by the World Animal Health Organisation as a collaborating, collaborating centre promoting veterinary laboratory capacity building. But for the point of the talk today, we should note that we're an OIE collaborating centre for new and emerging diseases as well as for uh, avian influenza. So avian influenza uh, particularly H5N1 influenza we know is one of the uh, uh, diseases like Hendra, like Nipah, uh, which the world uh, keeps a watching brief on because uh, uh, we're in the happy situation at present where these uh, viruses, although they've got a very high case fatality rate, uh, they uh, aren't contagious in the way that uh, influenza viruses are normally. And if we had that high level of infection person to person, with a highly, uh, with a virus with a high case fatality rate, would obviously have a big problem. And uh, just you know that that movie Contagion. I hope you've all seen it. But uh, we uh, really thought that that was a good movie. You know, some of those things they can be a bit uh, uh, well melodramatic. But uh, I found all of the scenarios that were presented one by one in that movie highly plausible except for the bit about needing bat cells to grow the virus. You'd have thought if it was ripping through people, it might have grown in an ordinary old cell culture. But never mind, they needed a story. <laughs> <laughs> but all of those sociological things, uh, 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 we've seen it all before, and uh, I just assumed that uh, it wasn't a proper movie, it was a bit of uh, public education put out by Homeland Security or something. Uh, probably one. Anyway, H5N1, we can see the stats. It's uh, still a... Uh, a potentially significant uh, human pathogen, and uh, here it's it's uh, uh, let's just uh, sort of focus on this bit. Uh, influenza viruses, as we know, are evolving continuously. Uh, mostly, uh, we, they do that through uh, through uh, where are we through mutations. But the, this possibility of reassortment of the virus, it's. Uh, you know, we're seeing this with more and more viruses now that we're sort of developing the tools to look more and more frequently. But anyway, reassortment of influenza virus is an active process and we can see that this virus uh, that spread uh, uh, rapidly throughout Southeast Asia in 2003 and uh, sort of globally in the subsequent years uh, evolved as a process of reassortment from viruses that were present in southern China at the time. So avian influenza viruses uh, are commensals, if you like. They're just part of the natural fauna of wild birds. And you can see they occur all over the world. There's 16 H types, uh, 9 N types. You can get any possible combination. But what experience over the years has shown is that where you have uh, H5 subtypes or H7 subtypes and they multiply uh, 
uh, not in wild birds but in domestic poultry, uh, then we can end up with a what we call a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus uh, that uh, that uh, kills poultry in you. Uh, and the uh, you know you can see the sorts of things a poultry farmer will, will be confronted with if he's got a highly pathogenic avian influenza virus. So this H5N1 out of uh, southern China uh, is a, a highly pathogenic virus and uh, is causing this sort of uh, problem in poultry production to food security uh, in many countries. Uh, in Australia, of course, our wild birds have all got uh, influenza viruses in them. It's a part of a surveillance program to uh, uh, keep a finger on the pulse of these. There's, uh, there's even H5s, uh, but they're not H5N1s. H5N2s, H5N3s are isolated from time to time from our own wild birds. Uh, but at the present time, we haven't had this uh, a uh, particular strain of H5N1. So, if it's, uh, you know, Malaysia uh, eradicated Nipah virus from their pigs, and if uh, H5N1 is such a big problem, uh, why don't we just simply eradicate it from our poultry populations all around the world? And, uh, and uh, sort of, you can see in the pale brood print, you know, the analysis of the FAO that it's sort of Unfortunately, not that simple because countries just don't have the expertise or the political will or the poultry industry is simply too complicated. And uh, Indonesia, for instance, uh, back in 2004, had a billion poultry. On any day of the year, there'd be a billion uh, birds uh, in commercial rearing and another 250 million in village uh, situations. So if you think to yourself, well, I'll just go around and uh, kill them all like they did the pigs in Malaysia, then uh, there's uh, one and a quarter billion birds to be uh, destroyed. Uh, one and a quarter billion birds for whom the owner is depending on for a livelihood who would like some compensation, thank you very much. And, and so it goes on. So uh, the veterinary services uh, aren't the same in, in all countries. The OIE now has a program of helping countries identify the deficiencies in the delivery of veterinary services and putting in international benchmarks and working with countries to try and uh, reach minimum standards around the world. But the fact is that, uh, here's my old colleagues, I worked in Indonesia for 10 years once, so I know these folk, and there in 2003 they've got these uh, highly pathogenic AI in poultry human cases not yet described, uh, and so they're doing the necropsies and trying to diagnose uh, for the first time this uh, virus that's killing their poultry. And uh, luckily they are taking uh, you know, some basic precautions and, and so none of them uh, became infected. But if we look at the markets, the features here, you can see there's fresh food preparation uh, immediately next to the pens that are holding the birds. If you look in the pens, you can see there's a broiler chickens here, I think there's ducks on the top. So everything's coming into the market, all being mixed together. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't only leave the market as food, but we can see that uh, people go to the market to buy live poultry to take home. So that chain of transmission, which we said before, depends exquisitely on being at a standstill of your livestock in societies like this one, uh, just hasn't been enforceable. So, uh, so these aspects of, uh, of human behaviour uh, to the present time have been uh, uh, irreconcilable with the outcome we're, we're looking for. Uh, the scientists, uh, myself included, have uh, had a lot of interesting uh, work to do. Uh, Indonesia was uh, one of the countries that, that keep, uh, kept submitting its uh, H5N1 isolates from the agricultural sector uh, to uh, reference laboratories, uh, the one in Geelong. And, uh, the people in public health uh, were taking a stand. The Minister of Public Health in Indonesia, you might recall, uh, uh, refused to supply human isolates to WHO collaborating centres because uh, uh, she didn't want Indonesia being ripped off and other countries, uh, farming you know, uh, companies, uh, becoming uh, sort of rich at the expense of Indonesia. Thank you very much. And that's caused you know, a real rethink in the way that the world does business in that area. So 
you know, it was a bit of a nuisance at the time, but perhaps it's uh, an achievement to that lady's credit in the long term. But anyway, uh, the, these uh, viruses from poultry uh, kept being received at, at Geelong. Uh, the molecular analysis there is, uh, is on isolates received at Geelong. A couple of points to point out, they're all of uh, clay 2.1, uh, which uh, uh, suggests that uh, Indonesia had only one introduction of H5N1 and because it's uh, different clades from that that are being uh, circulated amongst the other Southeast Asian countries at the present time. And likewise, uh, uh, you don't find clade 2.1 in the other Southeast Asian countries, so that suggests that uh, you know, not only is quarantine, national quarantine at the border working uh, in Indonesia, uh, but the disease isn't being introduced continuously by wild birds into Indonesia and uh, Indonesia uh, isn't uh, inadvertently uh, transferring their particular strain of the virus back to other countries. So those are all you know, positive stories that we uh, get from analyses of this type. But what we do see is that uh, this business of mutation of the, uh, of the HA gene is uh, occurring over time and different subclades uh, are emerging. So that led to a project whereby uh, uh, working with uh, the international agencies uh, through OFLU and funded by FAO, a project was developed to monitor this antigenic drift in, uh, in viruses in uh, Indonesia. And uh, there the systems were set up, uh, as we know, for the uh, selection of antigens for human uh, seasonal influenza vaccines. Uh, but uh, those systems have not existed in the avian influenza world, so we developed them from scratch. Uh, the human work is based on ferret antisera, uh, but in the beginning we sort of didn't have those and there was no time to develop tools, so we worked with uh, avian influenza uh, with chicken antisera, with chicken reagents, and were able to bring it to the, uh, the situation where the change in, uh, in the HA gene in Indonesia was able to be monitored and recommendations made about what strains to include in their poultry vaccines to, to that time. And this uh, slide just uh, reinforces that, where the, uh, the uh, vaccine antigens available from uh, you know, the big companies uh, internationally around the world uh, were quickly shown to be not uh, sufficiently antigenically matched to some of the strains that were emerging in the field in Indonesia. And that observation in the laboratory backed up with challenge tests showing that these vaccines were not protecting against a laboratory challenge with that virus. So that uh, work having uh, shown that initial promise has, has gone on and as we say we're uh, now selecting uh, uh, vaccine strains uh, for, for Indonesia. Uh, the, the vaccines, the, the global vaccine strains map up here somewhere. We can see that the field strains in Indonesia are drifting in this direction. Uh, this, this particular drift here is now defunct. We don't pick up viruses of this sort anymore. And in fact, the direction is heading in this way. So a nice little tool was developed and, uh, uh, to actually help with one of those aspects. But of course, vaccination is no substitute for uh, blocking the chain of transmission and, uh, and eradicating the disease. So uh, just a couple of slides to finish with to, uh, I don't know if One Health is, is in the vocabulary of people in this room, but if uh, you go on to you know, WHO websites, FAO websites, uh, OAE websites, you'll see it referred to. And it's just uh, a way of saying that we all inhabit this uh, planet together, that, uh, that uh, a lot of our new diseases uh, in people uh, have got a reservoir in animals, <coughs> and that, logically speaking, uh, public health and veterinary authorities really should be working together on these things. And, uh, and, uh, and I think it's almost as simple as that. Uh, but uh, actually making it happen is, uh, it can be quite a challenge. And, uh, you know, I know at the international level, you can just about every day of the week, uh, you can go to a conference somewhere saying what a good idea this is. Uh, but to actually make it happen is, uh, is a little bit harder because, for instance, uh, the Department of Health, uh, even in this country, doesn't want to suddenly start giving Geelong uh, uh, some of that 45 million that I mentioned is necessary to run the facility each year because uh, 
uh, they're probably uh, are equally valid to competing priorities rather than zoonotic disease. So, uh, uh, One Health, an easy thing to say, but uh, something to keep working towards. Uh, one group with which I'm associated that does uh, try and push in this direction is uh, this OFLU that I mentioned from time to time, and that's a, uh, a partnership between the OIE and the FAO, the two big uh, multilateral uh, agencies that deal with different aspects of animal health. And under that, uh, we sort of bring together experts from all around the world to work on a whole range of topics, and you can sort of see them on the website there. But one thing uh, on this One Health thing that I'm particularly uh, happy that we've been able to do is to contribute formally to the WHO vaccine strain selection meetings that are held twice a year. Now, they're primarily to choose the candidate antigens for human seasonal influenza vaccines. But ever since H5N1 was established as a, uh, as a uh, you know, potential pandemic threat, uh, then H5 antigens have been stored against the day that a, uh, a vaccine might be needed. And so uh, through this process, uh, the veterinary world is now making available to uh, the public health world, the WHO, uh, in a real-time fashion, information about the latest isolates of H5 coming out of uh, those endemic countries all around the world. And, uh, so uh, the work's being put together at present for the September WHO VCM meeting and uh, information from uh, uh, five or six countries where H5 is still endemic is going to be uh, collated by the OFLU team and, uh, and made available to public health. So uh, I think that's a nice example where uh, you can make things happen if, uh, if you can see the, uh, the value in doing so. So to finish, uh, I think we've uh, sort of laboured the point almost that, uh, that uh, we're in a global village, we need to be working together, uh, not only across uh, public health, uh, uh, veterinary or animal health uh, boundary, but uh, you know, in the veterinary world uh, we see more and more that uh, research is not a thing that an institution will do in isolation, it's public, it's uh, partnering with other institutes around the world. and. Uh, for instance, uh, there's a thing called the GFRA, the Global Foot and Mouth Disease Research Alliance, where anyone with an interest in researching uh, foot and mouth disease is getting together and meeting regularly and telling, telling everyone what they're doing. And uh, that is not resulting in uh, you know, unhealthy competition and people racing to beat you because there's so much money and time and effort involved in making an advance these days that people aren't really going to come along and steal your thunder. But uh, by all working together you can uh, work out what each partner can contribute and, uh, and avoid duplication. So that networking idea I think has got a lot to recommend it. And in, in closing uh, we sort of uh, noted that uh, animal disease at any rate can uh, be substantially controlled if we can uh, just get human beings to, uh, to do the right thing and, uh, and what's so hard about that. So uh, these elements of behavioural science and sociology, they're also creeping into uh, as part of the research agenda of these, uh, of these networks of uh, animal health labs at any rate. So I hope I haven't taken too long, but certainly leave it there and happy to take questions. Uh, thanks very much, Peter, for a wonderful presentation. And uh, I concur, I think everyone should watch the, the movie Contagion. And uh, you might be aware that Jesse Toe from our division actually did a, a nice review of that music, the actual science behind that, that movie, which is available at the Conversation website. But on, on that point, if I can ask the, the first question, is that um, the H1N1 um, uh, epidemic that we had in 2009 demonstrated very clearly that we can't contain an infection or spread of the infection by, in terms of humans. So what seems to be very, very critical is to the development of a, a vaccine in that particular case. And do you think there is sufficient infrastructure or should be focusing on infrastructure developing a vaccine that we could actually have out in the same season that a, a, an epidemic or pandemic happens? Uh, there are some diseases and some situations where we clearly uh, benefit from vaccines, and if I can just refer back to my talk, endrovirus in horses is one, we've got a use for it. 
uh, whereas Nika virus vaccine for pigs uh, was considered uh, not only not wanted, uh, not needed, but actually not wanted, because there there was zero tolerance. And, uh, and the idea was that if a pig farm was infected, you just killed all the pigs. It's so simple, you know. But the uh, for influenzas, then uh, uh, they they're going to spread among people. Uh, two things uh, were spoken about the uh, coordinating the veterinary world uh, with respect to avian influenzas, getting that information in so the right antigens are in the H5 vaccine bank. Uh, the veterinary world was caught a little bit flat-footed by pandemic uh, H1N1 uh, 2009 because swine influenza is so common that people don't bother to do or haven't been bothering to do surveillance for it. And uh, it's not seen as a production limiting disease. Uh, there's usually not any trade embargoes because your pigs have swine influenza. So the veterinary world wasn't monitoring what was happening in the pigs as closely as, uh, in retrospect, we might have done. Uh, we've now got a, an international group of swine influenza uh, uh, surveillance group, uh, sort of the meeting uh, once or twice a year and agreeing about all the procedures and which tests and who will do what. Uh, but that doesn't solve the problem of actually paying for it. And if you're going to have surveillance for anything, you've got to have people go out and collect specimens and bring them back to the lab and process them and have them analysed. And uh, so again, it's just a question of how much money uh, will be spent on that. But uh, I can see uh, there are already discussions going on with the Swine Influenza Group and WHO about how to feed any information that the veterinary world gets about influenza viruses in pigs into those WHO processes so the appropriate antigens can be there ahead of the event, hopefully next time. I might ask people to take their questions outside and have lunch with Peter. You're all very much welcome. Uh, so we're just running a little bit over time. Thanks again very much. Okay. For Thanks everyone.